their taste to be kept secret and private. Isn't that right? Not secret and private. We just weren't going to communicate certain things over text. Did you give, or did anybody give you any private information uh, the next day on January 30th? Didn't even give me private information. So, so let me put it in context. A text from Nicole Albert. We'll get info. We'll get more info tomorrow. I don't want to text about it. That was on the 29th, right? Okay. So, did you get additional info on the 30th, the next day? I have no idea. Did anything significant happen on January 30th in connection with this case? Any meetings? Any get-togethers? I, that you can think of. I went to the O'Keefe's house. Other than that, anything else? <clears throat> On the way home, um, Kerry Roberts' daughter is good friends with Michael Lank. So we dropped her off at Michael Lank's house. And Mike's wife came out of the house, him and Kerry are friends. And she you know, jumped in the car and was consoling Kerry and asks how the O'Keefe's were doing. And, you know, we talked to her. So you pulled up to Michael Lank's house on the 30th. That's never been reported, has it? I guess I never th thought much of it. Never thought about reporting the fact that one of the first responding officers on the case working for Canton PD, which is conflicted off the case, you had a meeting with that was unreported the next day? I you didn't meet I didn't meet with Michael Lank. I see. So you pulled up in the car. Tell me about that again. You pulled up in the car and what happened? And Lex, her daughter, went into the house. Okay. And then you just drove away? No. Michael's wife came out of the house. Okay. And y'all had a conversation about what? She got in the car and was her and Carrie are friends and she was checking on Carrie and, you know, just saying, oh my God, this is so crazy. You know, just checking in on the O'Keefe's. How long did that take? Well, they talk, Carrie's the talker, so I, could have been an hour. Could have been an hour standing outside? Sitting in the car. Sitting in the car on February 30th. Never came in the house? Uh, Feb not February 30th. Sorry, I said February 30th. January 30th. Never went in the house? I might have ran in to go to the bathroom. It's the back end of a blizzard. It's freezing cold outside. Mm -hmm. Sitting in the car for an hour. And the car was running, Carrie, and they were talking. It's her friend. Did you have any conversation before your testimony today with anybody about you going to Michael Lang's house on January 30th? Anybody? <laughs> Yes. Tell me about that. Who was it and when? It was a couple of weeks ago at the DA's office. The DA's office had an interview with you, correct? Not an interview. They just explained this process. I mean, a, a conversation? How about that? Yeah. Yes. You met with folks at the DA's office. Who'd you meet with? Um... Mr. Lally, Ms. McLaughlin, Steve Nelson, um, Trooper, Brian Tully. Um, I, I believe, oh, um, and another woman, I can't remember her name, unfortunately. Someone from the DA's office? Yes. Beelan? No. Lynn Beelan? No, um, she's here today. She works with Steve Nelson. Ah, but an employee of the DA's office. Yes. That sounds like a pretty big meeting. I wouldn't call it a big meeting. There was, what, five of them? How long did you, uh, five of them and then you, right? Uh, my daughter Allie came with me also. <laughs> the meeting's getting bigger. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? No, we both went. Was Allie in the room when you were... I was going to say interviewed, but you can take issue with every word I use. Mm -hmm. When you were talked to by the DA? Allie and I were both um, in the room when they received, when they went over everything, you know, how this all works, because this is all brand new to us. And then they asked me to leave the room. Um, 
you were about to say, and I lost the end of that sentence, when they received, received what? I didn't mean the word received. Did you receive anything? No. I looked at my grand jury notes. Um, now, at this meeting, was anybody taking notes? No. You have a bunch of lawyers and DAs, and nobody has a notepad in front of them? Like, notes? I believe Mr. Lally had a number of folders on the table. Taking notes? I know. I do not believe anyone was taking notes. It was a casual meeting to explain this process. Was that meeting recorded in any way that you're aware of? No. How long did the meeting last? Allie and I were probably in the room, I don't know, approximately 20 minutes. Then I left and they spoke with her and then I went back in and they spoke with me. How long did they speak with you? Honestly, maybe a half hour, hour. And during that I, half hour to an hour, did they go over with you what they expected your testimony to be? They never spoke about what they expected my testimony to be. They just um, showed me some pictures that might be shown. Um, I listened to the 911. What pictures? Um, just of the house and how I'd be asked to you know, show. Okay, we're going to put a picture of the house and you'll have a laser. Mr. Okay, when we started this conversation, it was because you said, in answer to my question, was anything ever brought up to you about this meeting at Lank's house? Mm -hmm. You said yes. Mm -hmm. So obviously they did talk to you about your testimony. It wasn't just about the process, correct? <coughs> I was told, I asked what discovery had been turned in in regard to me. So you wanted to prepare to make sure that you knew what you might be asked on cross-examination, correct? I wanted to know what was coming, yes. And you knew that one of the things was coming after this meet, well, let me ask it a different way. During this meeting, did Mr. Lally tell you one of the things that's gotta be coming is you had an off the books meeting at Lank's house for 45 minutes. Did he tell you that? No, that's not how I was told. Did he tell you that the defense had uncovered a report that established that you were actually at Michael Lang's house for 45 minutes that had never been reported to the defense or the prosecution before the phone extraction had been done. Did he tell you that? I was told, I was asked, oh, were you at Michael Lang's on the 30th? So you've had a lot of time to come up with a story about why you were at Michael Lang's, correct? Jackson. I'll allow it. I didn't need time to make up a story because I have the truth of why we went. And the truth, according to you, is you pulled up at Michael Lang's house. The first responding officer and friends of the Alberts had a meeting with him the next day that was never reported to anybody for any purpose. I just met with his wife out in the car while the car was running for 45 minutes to an hour. That's your story. It's not a story, it's the truth. Carrie dropped her daughter off. The wife came out. Carrie is a talker. They started talking. A tragedy had happened the day before. It is interesting, would you not agree, that the day before you had this off the books meeting at Michael Lang's house, Nicole Albert says, we'll get more info tomorrow meaning the very day you show up at Lang's house. Again, I never spoke with Mike Lank at his house. It was not an off the books meeting. It was Carrie dropping her daughter at one of her good friend's house, whose husband happens to be a Canton cop. That, it, that is what it is. That is the truth. A lot of coincidences. Jackson. Christine. Yes. Let's squeeze in a break while they had that pause there inside of the courtroom, seeming to show some signs of wear there for Jennifer McCabe on day two of testimony, and it's not over. This cross examination, more after this.
We are underway in the trial of doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Morgan, I should never come up with this. His wife, Lori Valla Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. back to Court TV Live. Thank you for following along with us. We are watching the testimony in the killer or cover-up murder trial. The case that is about what happened at Fairview Street on the night of January 29th of 2022. All of that is key to the murder case against Karen Reed. Here's a look at some of the family connections that we're hearing play out in this testimony between the McCabe's and the Alberts. Brian and Nicole Albert, who both testified earlier in this case, they were once the homeowners of that house on Fairview Street. Jennifer McCabe, who's testifying now, she's the sister of Nicole and was present on the scene with Karen Reed. We also know that these people were present inside of the house in the night in question. Most of them have testified to John O'Keefe, the victim in this case, not entering the house before he was found on the lawn outside of the home. The defense refutes that. Now, this is a look at the people who have testified so far. And right now, Jennifer McCabe, someone who was in that home at a certain point, is testifying now. Let's go back to that testimony under cross-examination by Karen Reed's attorney, picking it up right where we left off. Um, that, by the way, uh, what did Mr. Lally show you uh, in res respect of this issue about this meeting at Michael Lake's house? He showed me nothing. He just told you about it? Brian Tully told me. Okay, what did Mr. Tully tell you, Trooper Tully? What exactly did he tell you? at this meeting about this Michael Lank issue. He said, did you go to Michael Lank's on January 30, 30th? And at first I said, no, I've never been to his house. And then I thought about it and I said, oh my gosh, yes, I did go there. And that was the extent of the conversation. You said, yeah, I did go there. And he didn't ask a follow up, like what the heck were you doing at Michael Lank's house the day after this issue? Objection. I'll allow it. He didn't ask to follow up like that? I do not believe he did. So, Trooper Tully, had you come down for an interview, he confronted you with a, a fact that had never been disclosed before, to wit, you showed up at Michael Lank's house, and when you said, yeah, oh yeah, hang on, I think your words were, oh my gosh, yeah, I think I did go there. And he didn't ask a follow up question? He was there, you're, Yes, you're, you're spinning all of this. I, I, Ma'am, I do a lot of things. Yeah. I don't spin. There's a judge here to make sure that I don't spin. I'm asking you a question. It's very direct. I do not believe he asked me a follow-up question. So that was the end of that conversation about Michael Lowe, correct? Correct. Mr. Lally didn't have any follow-up questions? I don't believe Mr. Lally was in the room. Uh, who else? I thought you said Mr. Lally and Ms. McLaughlin. I they were. They might not have been in the room at that time. I see. So Mr. Lally just happened to, what, just saunter out? It was a different time. So Mr. Lally was in and out of the conversation? Mr. Lally was not there when this conversation happened. Well, why is that? Because I met with Brian Tully and he was not there. Was Brian Tully taking notes? No. He's a state trooper interviewing a witness. And he, he, he was... Objection. Sustained. The same report that has you at Michael Lang's house mm -hmm. also has you picking up Nicole Albert going by, the, going by 34 Fairview just before you went to Michael Lang's house. You aware of that? We did not pick up Nicole Albert. So you went by 34 Fairview, then diverted, and right after you went by 34 Fairview, went directly over to Michael Lang's house. What was the reason that you stopped by 34 Fairview first? We didn't stop by. Maybe Carrie slowed down, but we did not stop by 34. So you drove by, did a drive by 34 Fairview for giggles? Why? No, that's how we get to Michael Lang's house. If the report shows that you actually stopped at 34 Fairview and then went to Michael Lang's house, 
Would we have another oh my gosh moment? Nope, no oh my gosh moment. We did not pick up Nicole Albert. Did anybody else go with you over to Michael Lang's house? No, it was Carrie, myself, and her daughter. Your Honor, um, maybe approach briefly. Okay. And they're taking a sidebar here. And again, we're at the very end of the day for cross-examination, but not the end of this cross-examination. Karen Reed's attorney, Alan Jackson, really taking his time to go through every single detail of this case. Every day that passed after the death of John O'Keefe. Let's go back in and listen to what happens after that sidebar breaks up. Talked uh, in some detail about your calls with John O'Keefe on the morning of January 29th. Uh, do you call that conversation? Yes. Um, I want to focus your attention on or about or at or about 12:14 a.m. Moving up to about 12:50 a.m. You have that time in mind? Yes. You've seen uh, the Celebrite extraction from John O'Keefe's phone, which Mr. Lally showed me the other day. Correct. Correct. And you went through the series of phone calls that were made and that appear on his extraction report, correct? Correct. I just want to run through those time-wise very quickly just to orient you, if I can, and then I'll ask you some specific questions about it. There was a call at 12.14 a.m., correct? Correct. That was a call that you indicated was answered. You had a conversation with Mr. O'Keefe. Correct. There was a call at 12.18 and 47 seconds. That call also was answered by you. John O'Keefe made that phone call, correct? Correct. Then there's the 12.29 and 44 second call that you indicated was not answered. Correct. And that was a call to you, from, sorry, from you to him. Correct. There was a 12.41 call from you to, to John O'Keefe, correct? That was... Correct. There was a 12.41 and 54 second call from you to him, is that right? Correct. There was a 12.43 and 19 second call from you to him. Correct. 12.46 a.m. and 16 seconds from you to him. Correct. 12.47 and 52 seconds from you to him. Correct. And 12.50 and 37 seconds from you to him, correct? Correct. <clears throat> you saw in his extraction report that all of those calls after 1218 were missed calls, correct? In the, his report that you showed me? Correct. In other words, the only two calls that were answered were the 1214 and 1218. Everything else was a missed call. I believe so. I would have to refer to it again because I've seen so many reports. And Ms. McCabe, according to the extraction reports that you've seen this morning, comparing yours to his, Every single one of those calls was deleted off your phone, correct? According to the reports. According to that report, yes. Let me ask you another question. <clears throat> Have you ever misplaced your phone? Yes. In, in, in life, everybody does it, right? Yes. What's one of the first things you do if you're with your daughter or your husband or your, a friend and you're in your house and you misplace your phone? What do you do? I'll, I'll ask them to call my phone. Right. Mm -hmm. Even over and over and over, right? Correct. Could be as many as five, six, seven times. Usually I hear it the first or second time. You're looking for a buzz or a ring, isn't that right? Correct. And you might do that if you're searching for a missing phone, correct? Correct. With regard to the calls that were deleted from your phone, you were asked about this under oath at another proceeding, weren't you? Correct. And you claimed at another proceeding that you had an explanation for all these missed calls starting 1229, 1241, 1241, 1243, 1246, 1247, 1250. Mm -hmm. You have an explanation for that, right? Can I see the report? I'm asking you about your prior testimony. And I'm asking about these calls. Yes, I'm asking, can I see it, please? I'm asking you a different question. 
at your other at this other proceeding, which mm -hmm. were under oath. Yes. Right. You explained that these calls were what? These missed calls, incessant missed calls. What were they? You used a word. I write two words. I believe I used the word butt dials. You claimed that every one of these calls was a butt dial. Is that right? Yes. So according to you, you literally butt dialed John O'Keefe's phone six times in the span of 19 minutes. Is that right? I don't remember making any of those calls. So my assumption is I put my phone in my back pocket and that was it. <laughs> when you dial someone by mistake, you hit a button, Set your phone down. The phone has to be open. You'll agree with that, right? Correct. It can't be locked because it takes several iterations of movement to get a phone open. Face ID or password, right? Correct. So when you hit the button, by mistake, walk away. That's a butt dial. People call butt dials. What happens with the call? I assume it goes to voicemail. Good assumption because that's exactly what it does, isn't it? You've had a phone for a lot, a lot of years, right? Yes. It rings and rings and rings until it goes to voicemail. Correct. So in order to hang up that butt dial, you have to interact with that phone yet again, don't you? Yes. So if you had six butt dials, <coughs> seven, I think it's seven butt dials, you'd not only have to interact with the phone once to butt dial, John, you'd then have to interact with it every single time to turn off that phone ringer so it doesn't go to voicemail, wouldn't you? I suppose. Which makes 14 interfaces with that phone over the course of 19 minutes. Is that right? I mean, I guess I don't have it all right in front of me, but there were also text messages I was sending, so again, maybe I said, oh shoot, I called them, and then I turned it off. But your claim is you don't remember those incessant butt dials and those incessant hang-ups at all, correct? I, I honestly don't. So you would have had to forget that you interacted with... By, by the way, you'll agree that the phone extraction showed that John O'Keefe got no voice from you, right? I didn't look, but... So that means you would have had to interact with that phone 14 times over the course of 19 minutes at the exact time frame that the Commonwealth suggests John O'Keefe lost his life. Objection. Sustained. You can ask that differently, and this will be your last question for today, please. Yes, Your Honor. The period between 1229 and 1250, which is the exact period that you were, quote, butt-dialing John multiple times, that's also the exact period that John O'Keefe was rendered incapacitated. Isn't that right? Sure. That's sustained. We'll start up again tomorrow, okay? Thank you. All right, folks, so I'm going to want to stay here and walk out.